Are you as full as you want to be? Because most therapists aren't as full as they want to be, or they are just bursting at the seams. If you are the one that knows that you could see more clients and you just aren't sure what to do next, we have got an amazing new course for you that's completely free. It's called 40 Days to Full. 40 Days to Full. The goal is that within 40 days, you will be as full as you want to be. And it's delivered all via text message. Every day, you're going to get one text that has a paragraph of exactly what you need to do to fill up. So if you want to join 40 Days to Full completely free, just text hashtag 40, so hashtag 40, to the number 231-422-0677. Again, that's hashtag 40 to 231-422. 0677. Your data and messaging rates will probably apply. Can't wait to help you fill up. This is the Practice of the Practice podcast with Joe Sanox, session number 917. Welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. I hope you are doing amazing today. As you heard, hopefully you didn't fast forward through that uh, front end sponsor because it's us. And we have a brand new course that is delivered to you all via text. So it's called 40 Days to Full. It's going to take you from being not as full as you want to be to being full in 40 days. Remember, just use hashtag 40, so hashtag 40, and just text that to 231 422-0677, and you are going to get a daily text about how to stay full. And, you know, I wrote a book about taking time off. So those 40 days are not all work, 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 because that would be terrible if you had 40 days of work. So it's five days of content and then two days of reminders to play, have fun, smile, take a breath, step back from work, things like that. So 40 days to full, um, hashtag 40 over to that number. Well, um, before we dive too far in, you probably saw um, the title of today's show. Um, Just want to make sure uh, that if you have kids in the car, if you are, you know, listening to this on a loudspeaker in your house, just know that we're going to cover a lot of different things. We're going to be covering sex therapy. We're going to be covering um, a lot of things that maybe you may not be ready to talk to your kids about or your partner or other people. Just be conscientious of that as we dive in today. Just consider yourself warned. But with that said, we don't want to stick what we're talking about either. So I am so excited. We have Dr. Tisha Morgan. Tisha is a psychotherapist, a published author, adjunct professor, TEDx speaker, and co-founder and director of the Westland Academy of Clinical Sex Therapy and Westland Therapy Group. Dr. Morgan specializes in sex therapy and couples counseling and has a successful full-time private practice woo-hoo, for over 15 years. Tisha, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I mean, even as we just got talking before we started rolling, like I can tell this is going to be a fun, interesting, educational episode on all sorts of different aspects of sexuality for humans. And uh, I'm just really excited to have this episode as part of our library. Oh, me too. I mean, I love talking about these things, obviously. Yeah, well, you know, one of the first questions that I always kind of ask people is is usually around origin story. It's interesting to hear kind of before you started doing your clinical work, you know, how did you get into sex therapy? Was that something that like, I don't know, in second grade you were writing, like, I want to be a sex therapist or, you know, kind of throughout the years, did you decide like, you know what, like, this is the direction that I want to go in? You know, I always used to watch Sue Johansson, the Sunday night sex show or talk sex with Sue um, here in Canada growing up uh, as a youth. And I thought she was amazing and what a cool job that was. But I knew I didn't want to be a nurse. So I just kind of thought I didn't know sex therapists existed. So I just thought, well, I guess this is just not a profession I can go into. But it was always in the back of my mind. And then when I started doing my master's, I was doing a lot of my courses around like, you know, the etiology of fetishism and how these develop and everything else. And my proc was like, you seem interested, like maybe you should explore this more. And then it was a light bulb moment. I'm like, I'm sorry, you can specialize in sex (laughs) as a psych degree. Um, And then it was just gung ho from there. Because, you know, if you're going to talk about anything in psychology, I was like, well, this is obviously the most interesting topic to me, at least. So then it was just kind of, yeah, uh, heading that direction from there. 
That that's awesome. And when when you first started out, um, were there certain certifications or things that you kind of right away knew you needed to get or wanted to get, or um, was it kind of you dipped your toes in for a bit? How did that educational side uh, towards the beginning of your career start? Yeah, it was really tough actually, which is part of the reason we developed the Westland Academy of Clinical Sex Therapy because I really struggled to get the kind of training and knowledge that I needed so that I felt. Um, knowledgeable enough to tackle some of these issues. So at the time, there was no courses in human sexuality from a sex therapist perspective at the master's and doctoral level, unless I wanted to just do, you know, women's studies, for instance, um, Mm -hmm. in which they will have and explore things like LGBTQ and the history behind that. And um, I really wanted very specific, like, how do I treat vaginismus? What do we do if erectile dysfunction walks into my office? Like, what what is the difference between like BDSM, healthy BDSM, and trauma reenactment? And I really couldn't find anything. So um, I begged, borrowed, and stealed my way to get underneath a sex therapist to do some of my practicum um, in Vancouver. And then from there, I went to San Francisco and to the institute and really tried to get some hands-on knowledge as well um, in that realm. And that was really eye-opening and wonderful. And some courses at UBC and um, now Adler. I helped create um, their uh, intro to sex therapy course at Adler University here in Canada and the States. So now that is available, at least here, but uh, at the time it wasn't. So my long-winded response is I really struggled, um, but now I think the options are better. Mm. You know, on your website, so it kind of lists out a lot of the different things that you specialize in. So BDSM, kink literacy, uh, ethical non-monogamy, polyamory, uh, all sorts of different, uh, you know, like erectile dysfunction. Uh, I would love because, you know, it's been a long time for a lot of us since grad school. And depending on the grad school we went to, I would love to really dig in for most of the episode of just like, let's have a quick masterclass on what should people know about the variety of options that people are considering are having, you know, even as you talked about BDSM compared to trauma reenactment, those are terms that I've heard uh, and that I, you know, think I have a somewhat amateur working knowledge of, but I think being able to have an episode where we really dig into some of those terms to make sure people have a strong working knowledge and then also some resources if they want to go further into that work would be so helpful. So uh, with that said, uh, where should we start? Yeah, so I mean, great question, because obviously, you know, I've been in this for a while, and I throw around terms like BDSM and kink, and I forget sometimes that it rolls off the tongue. It's not always common knowledge. But um, BDSM typically bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism, masochism, kind of any form of all of those make up that word. Um, And kink is usually paired with BDSM. So we say working with BDSM and kinky clients um, is an aspect of that. Um, As far as BDSM goes and learning about it, we do have a course on working with kinky clients, and that covers absolutely everything. So I had mentioned kind of that BDSM versus trauma reenactment, and I think that's huge. Um, So looking at, you know, what BDSM, healthy BDSM is versus what it isn't. So like BDSM in general would include things like having presence and consent, communication, clarity, opportunity for reclamation, having frameworks of consent like SAC or RAC or all of these things, which we go into for the course. Trauma reenactment looks like a lack of presence, dissociation, um, consent being obtained through things like coercion, lack of communication, lack of power, choice, potential for re-injury, like a lot of these things. Um, we actually interviewed, in all of our courses, we do expert interviews um, with people in the field. So Maureen McVoy, she is amazing. And she is a trauma therapist, an educator that really specializes in BDSM and abuse and the differences between those. Um, so that's part of our course. Um, and then we interview BDSM and sex educators, um, Leatherman and gay activists, um, all of those sorts of things as well. But yeah, it's kind of going through what is consent. How does that look in the BDSM community, for instance? What's the difference between the lifestyle and the scene, the history of BDSM, relationship dynamics, the neurobiology behind it, um, barriers to care for clients, um, and really looking at how we can use the plicit model um, to address all sexuality-based concerns, including BDSM and kink, for instance. Well, what other terms should people know before we kind of dive into the model and, and talk through it? 
Yeah, so other general kind of sexuality-based terms that we chuck around um, for, let's say, clients that are coming into your office, uh, we talk about things like ED, PE, DE. Um, So ED would stand for erectile dysfunction, PE, premature ejaculation, DE, delayed ejaculation. Um, And we have courses on that as well. Um, Other things like polyamory, ethical non-monogamy, consensual non-monogamy, swinging, um, and the differences kind of all, they're they're all typically around a broad umbrella term. Um, But polyamory, poly obviously means many. Um, Amory, amor means love, many loves. Um, So having multiple partners in a very, in a non-monogamous way, such as ethical non-monogamy, also called consensual non-monogamy, um, basically how to do that in a way that is consensual, ethical, above ground um, with active communication um, and swinging. So how would that difference look like between um, polyamory, for instance, for some couples? Um, so there's some generalized, I guess, terms. Um, and then other ones that are a little bit more medical focused. Often we just say painful intercourse. Um, the DSM would call it um, GPPD, which is genital pelvic pain and penetration disorder. And underneath those, there's a whole host of vaginismus, dyspareunia, vulvodynia. I mean, I can talk for ages, but again, we have a course on painful sex as well. And that's a little bit more medical or in-depth on that aspect of those terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, for the average therapist to even just be able to, if a a couple comes in or, you know, if, you know, some, some people that you have relationships and connections and all of that together, and they're using these terms, how important it is to really understand and be respectful. And I I remember my first time in um, post-grad school, uh, I was working uh, with three people that had a long-term partnership together and they called each other husbands and wives. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never done this. I don't know what to do. But then when we actually dug into this long-term, it was more of a V-shape uh, with the man being at the center of the V. And it, it was really interesting how a lot of just the Gottman types of communication and being open and having discussions and money issues. It's like, oh, this, like, and I'm sure that there's also times when you need a specialist and you need, you know, like much more training than what I had. Um, but what they were presenting with was really basic kind of relationship issues. And, and, you know, to realize to myself, you know what, like a lot of some of these things, you know, are still issues of communication, of consent, of being ethical, like all the things that you just talked about and listed. Um, Could you walk through kind of the types of issues that you would say the average therapist, yeah, you definitely handle that. You've got the skills to do that. You just need to maybe have a little bit better working knowledge. And then maybe when do we need to refer out? When do we need to look for a specialist? Yeah. So, I mean, typically, like you just said so eloquently, often a lot of it comes back to just like respectful, honest, transparent, effective communication um, in a vast majority of things. Right. Um, And I think that's a core foundation of therapy, obviously, within a non-judgmental and empathetic environment. Um, And that's obviously very pivotal in any issues, especially when we're talking about sexuality based concerns, because there's so much shame that lives there. Um, And it's a very vulnerable place to be and to share with your therapist or a couple, for instance, a partner. Um, So definitely as a foundation. Then I think it's really important, or at least from our perspective, we typically look at most sexuality-based concerns in the form of the PLICIT model. So the PLICIT model was developed by Jack Adden. um, And PLICIT is an acronym. So it stands for permission, which is basically the client comes into your office and they're having, let's say, some concerns with their, you know, penis. Just being able to like hold the space and give them permission to feel comfortable enough to address those issues with their therapist, especially if the therapist is not a sex therapist and saying, you know, like I'm really struggling in my marriage to be able to like keep an erection um, or sustain it or to get it or whatever else. That can be really tough to say. Um, And I know a lot of clients, for instance, they won't bring up specific issues because of fear of judgment, um, especially if they're in the poly community or the BDSM kink community. Um, They just don't think their um, therapist will understand or specifically if they're in a thruple, right? No, our therapist will just try to separate us and tell us that this is wrong or won't work or whatever it may be. So permission is the very first step. And I think most therapists hopefully can get to that stage. The second one, the LI stands for limited information. So this is really where we're working on, like, do you have some tools? 
um, that you can share in an educational format with them. So limited information might be like, you know, you're experiencing erectile dysfunction um, or premature ejaculation. Have you been to your doctor and get some blood tests done? Because, for instance, if you have hypothyroidism, that can cause premature ejaculation. Um, testosterone issues can cause this. So some really just limited information around some like, you know, bare minimum um, causes and things that they may be differing, some book suggestions. Then the next um, aspect of the PLICIT model, which stands for specific suggestions, again, that's really where more training is needed. So if somebody has premature ejaculation, for instance, are you able to walk them through what is the squeeze technique? How do Kegel exercises come into play for this? How are they working those pubococcygeal muscles in conjunction with the fleshlight in order to help fix premature ejaculation? So really like the tangible, knowledgeable suggestions to help counter an issue. And then the IT um, is intensive therapy. And that's really when we're talking about trauma, for instance, and really making sure that the therapists um, have the training needed to address a specific concern with intensive therapy. So as far as when to refer out, that would differ, obviously, for every therapist, their knowledge base and the issue that comes in to see them. So if they're not knowledgeable on how to fix premature ejaculation, then they might be referring out by the time they get to limited information stage. Right. Um, or, you know, they might be able to get through all the stages, but then we're in BDSM and the person is doing trauma reenactment and they're like, wow, this intensive therapy, I'm not OK doing. I don't know the differences. I'm going to have to refer out here. So it's really just trying to do ethical work with each client that walks in the room. Going in network with insurance can be tough. I know when I took insurance, there were long wait times and it was so confusing. Filing all the right paperwork is time consuming and tedious. And even after you're done, it can take months to get credentialed and start seeing clients. That's why Alma makes it easy and financially rewarding to accept insurance. When you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access enhanced reimbursement rates with major payers. They also handle all of the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions and guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. Once you've joined Alma's insurance program, you can see clients in your state of licensure regardless of where you're working from. It's amazing to know that you can be fully online. Learn more about building a thriving practice with Alma at helloalma.com forward slash Joe. That's hello. A L M A dot com slash Joe to get started. Now, if you were to tell every therapist in the world to update their intake uh, forms, their intake questions to be more inclusive, like what changes would you want to see in regards to the information gathered in the paperwork and the information gathered in that very first session? Oh, what a great question. I think always trying to ask a question as if you are already assuming that they do that with regards to their answer. So instead of saying like, you know, um, do you have sex with men? Uh, let's say a male walks into your office. Do you have sex with men? Um, when is the last time you've had sex with a man? So always the assumption that you're expecting a specific answer and then they can say, oh, I actually am heterosexual or, you know, so on like forms and questions and intakes, um, also leaving the space for different relational dynamics and different sexual, you know, orientations and presenting. So it's um, the person is not just assuming that you have a partner and it is of the opposite sex. Maybe you have multiple partners of multiple different sexes and dynamics and you're okay with that. So just the intake form in general, showing that you're open to if they are poly or gay or straight or gender non-binary or anything else. I think now that plicit model, you're immediately giving them that permission to be authentic in how they present themselves. Mm. And then, you know, when we're actually in the intake session and people are asking questions, like what, what are a handful of kind of doors that you can open to have this be part of that intake session uh, if people want to walk through that door? Mm -hmm. um, 
I guess, yeah, depending on the presenting issue. So if a couple comes in and they're saying, you know, they're having issues with their communication or issues in the bedroom, then again, asking questions with regards to, you know, when is the last time that, you know, you experiencing, you were experiencing problems with your penis? Or when is the last time that you struggled to um, reach orgasm? Um, those sorts of things. Um, so then again, you're assuming that these things are happening and you're opening the door for that. Um, or, you know, again, with the questions, is there thirds um, in regards? Are you in a monogamous relationship or a poly relationship rather than just assuming that they are monogamous or that they would like to, you know, stay that way? Um, yeah. It's a curiosity. Yeah. Now, um, as you enter into the, this work, uh, where do you see therapists uh, that you're consulting with, that you're helping, that you're teaching, um, where do they have missteps? And then maybe also where do they have successes that maybe they didn't expect? Hmm. Good question. Um, successes that maybe do they didn't expect. I think at least personally, one of the best parts of this job is when somebody comes in feeling really hopeless and then like after a few sessions, you see like marked amazing improvement and how excited they are um, and how much hope they get filled with. And I think sometimes just some specific suggestions or limited information is enough to just like boost that hope tenfold. So I think um, sometimes therapists, when they just see that, you know, I just gave them that educational piece and now look at the change in attitude, narrative and emotion that walked out of my office. I think that's a really quick way to get those success moments that can really fill our tank as therapists. Um, missteps, I think not referring out or getting supervision or education on specific sexuality things. I think a lot of people say they do marriage and um, couples counseling or, you know, sex therapy and couples counseling. But then when it really comes down to it, they may be open to talking about, you know, sex um, and uh, relationships, but like, are they really kink knowledgeable? Are they, you know, uh, can they go deeper with regards to helping these couples? Um, like, for instance, a, a couple came into me and they were talking about uh, BDSM and kink and coming into this dungeon and some of the rules they were learning. And they were talking about this vlogger they had and just like immediately like safety. Like, are you doing figure eights and are you not hitting the kidneys is the first thing I could think in my brain. Right. So I think mm -hmm. there's also something, a difference between just giving them permission to talk about those things and actually helping them walk through st two stages of safety. Um, and I think that can sometimes be a misstep of misrepresenting ourselves as I'm just sex positive. Therefore, I can do sex therapy. I think that's great. But I, sex positivity. I want to go back to your figure eights and kidneys because I don't know what that means. And I would love for you to because if someone <laughs> is doing therapy and they hear that and then they're like, oh, wait, what was the kidney figure eight thing? I would love for people <laughs> to at least leave with that. Like, what, what is that? Yeah. So that's just more so in like using toys um, appropriately. Right. So a lot of us know basic things with regards to like vibrators and how you clean them or, you know, how you can use them or not sharing of toys and those sorts of things. But I think again, when you get more so into kink, it's like a couple bought a collar and then they bought a flogger and that's great. But now their partner is, let's say bent over in a doggy style position or what, or maybe they're attached to a St. Andrew's cross, which is just an X for instance. Um, and this person has a flogger and they're hitting them with the flogger. Um, there's a specific way to kind of use that flogger in a way that's pleasurable mixed with pain versus just painful or perhaps damaging, depending on how hard mm -hmm. you're actually hitting them. So we always say like, you're making sure you, you never aim for any area near the kidneys, right? We can go higher, we can go lower than that, but not near the kidneys. And figure eights are usually a great way to help with things like with floggers, for instance, to start out in the process of learning how to use one. Um, you're using your hand and creating a figure eight in the air um, is what I mean by a figure eight with the flogger. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure there's like a million of those little things that, you know, if if people are are learning it, like if I were in a session and someone, you know, said that, I would just ask them questions and, and say, you know, this this isn't something I'm super knowledgeable on. And, you know, if you want a therapist that is, then like let's let's work to find one. Um to me that seems like to just kind of be humble in the process and non judgmental and just 
be curious uh, to me would be one of the best kind of attributes in that. Um, there, I know that you have lots of courses and, and things like that, and we'll, we'll talk about how people can get access to those. But uh, do you have favorite podcasts, books? Like, what's in your like your arsenal of of library? Like, here here's my go to for therapists to build their personal knowledge, or to, for you know therapists to say to clients, you know, if you want to learn more, here's a podcast that I heard about on Joe Sanok's podcast. Go listen to this. Um, what are, what are some of those things that you would say are, are helpful for people to grow their knowledge? Oh, great question. Obviously, your podcast. Let's be honest, Joe. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the one episode. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, no, great question. So uh, I think that if, if a therapist is really looking to work on and learn more knowledge about, let's say, female sexuality, low sexual desire or low libido, um, uh, couples and different scenes of sex drive, um, those sorts of things. Um, Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagotsky is a great book. Um, uh, that's always in my arsenal. Um, as far as polyamory, ethical non-monogamy, kind of working with poly couples and clients, uh, the ethical slut, more than two, and opening up. I think those three books are kind of like a good staple to head towards. Um, if you have clients that have ADHD, for instance, um, ADHD After Dark um, by Ari Tuckman, I believe, um, that also kind of looks at how ADHD can influence our sexuality and our encounters. Um, if you're looking to how to actually um, insert things like sensate focus exercises in sex therapy, um, there's the sensate focus in sex therapy, the illustrated manual by Wiener and Avery Clark, I believe it is. Um, and that book's great. And it's an illustrated aspect. And it works through everything from couples to individuals to those with um, differing abilities. Um, uh, I think that's fantastic. Um what is some other ones? As far as kink, becoming a kink aware therapist is a great one. Um, the color of kink, black woman, BDSM and pornography. Um, pleasure activism is interesting. Uh, I wrote a book called Heads Up um, about increasing your sexual confidence, expanding your sexual repertoire and kind of getting the real lowdown on oral sex. That is just about fellatio um, or blowjobs, though. It's just one directional. Um, but that's one. Um, I guess those are a lot of the ones in my staple. I also love a That's lot cool. of, um, by Esther Perel. She has great courses and stuff, Rekindling Desire Online, um, and her erotic blueprints can be helpful for therapists to look into. Um, yeah. And finally, last but not least, uh, Betty White, The Wheel of Consent. Uh, I think walking through that with clients can be uh, a game changer with regards to their communication their sexual love language or their sexual schemas um, and how they can connect sexually um, by exploring that wheel of consent and those four kind of sexual love languages. Mm. That can't be the actress, Betty White. Uh, sorry, Betty Martin. Oh my gosh. Oh, I, was, I was like picturing <laughs> Betty White talking about the wheel of consent and I was dying on the inside. I'm like, no, that can't be the same <gasps> Betty White. <laughs> Wouldn't that be hilarious? Just Betty White there, just all in her gray hairness, just talking about sex. Sorry, Betty Martin's wheel of consent. Betty Martin's. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That oh. makes more sense to not be. Well, I mean, Betty White had such a great stand up thing about how she was talking about um, like grow some balls and she's like, balls are weak. Like they crumble. And she was talking about how like people should say grow a vagina because it like, you know, births a child and all these other things. And oh, it was just hilarious. She's just so funny. I my grandma loved Betty White and like my grandma would be inappropriate also, but it was also an evangelical. It was she was so like interesting. So um funny. anyway, um, so I had another question. Oh, so you had mentioned um one of the books you mentioned was pornography, and I know that we've got maybe five or ten minutes left, but I wanted to because I, I hear different therapists, depending on their spiritual background, depending on their their own thoughts around pornography, throw around the term pornography addiction. And um, you and I were talking before we started um, rolling about just like pornography, quote, addiction. And I would love to talk a little bit about that. And then also, how does spirituality or how we were raised um, impact you know what we're talking about here? And of course, that's 
an enormous topic that we could never cover in five or 10 minutes, um, <laughs> nor five or 10 episodes. Um, but we'd love to hear about your thoughts on pornography, your thoughts on kind of religion and how that plays in, how people were raised, and then, um, then we'll land this thing somehow. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, yes. So, I mean, it, the pornography addiction is not in the DSM-5 currently. So a lot of sex therapists are black or white. They're on one side of the coin or on the other. Some believe for sure pornography addiction is a thing and it needs to be addressed and treated. And other people say it is not a thing. We do not have the research and quantitative data to support this. I shy towards the it is a thing and I see it daily in my office with regards to um, pornography issues, um, masturbation issues, erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation that result from masturbation tendencies, pornography and pornography addiction. So I would say yes, um, it is a thing. And it is a large percentage of my work with specifically men, not that women can't, but you know, 99% of men are coming in with that, um, and how that affects their penis, their intimacy and their problems with their partner. So that's huge. Um, with regards to kind of religion, um, and that aspect, Yes, again, another large piece of my work, um, shame-based approach um, to sexuality, masturbation, the body, intimacy, sex, all of those things is massive. Um, and I have couples and individuals that come in that really struggle to communicate or to have shame-free sex, even though maybe they were raised in a religious household and now that they're married, but then um, they still have that like underlying sense of like dirtiness um, or wrongness or shame in the sexuality component. And they're really struggling to communicate it and to let that go um, and explore themselves and their partners. So a lot of work on the shame compass and its role and how we talk through that with couples and individuals is, is massive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and when you think about um, spirituality, religion, how people are raised, and we don't need to get into specific denominations, but like, what are some of the things that in your therapeutic work you're seeing as you know setting people up with maybe unhealthy adult sexuality? Yeah, um, any any viewpoint that what is happening with regards to your body. Um, your pleasure centers, uh, touching of yourself and your interactions with others. Anytime we view that as something as dirty, wrong, horrible, um, sinful, whatever, that really creates a pretty intense negative uh, imprinting or sexual imprinting. And that is incredibly hard to undo. Um, so I think a lot of work is going back to that family of origin and those religious teachings. And how are we aligning those now with your current values? And if you still do believe all of those things, um, how is that affecting your dynamic with your partner? Because obviously shame enters the scene when our values and our behaviors are not in alignment, right? Um, so then it's kind of a readdressing some of those fundamental belief systems um, with regards to sexuality. And that's a big piece. Mm. Well, the last question I always ask is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Mm. I guess to be incredibly curious, um, in all aspects, um, no matter who the client is, what they walk in with, um, really leading with curiosity. Um, I find personally that sometimes I fall into the trap of, oh, yeah, yeah, it's been two sessions and you've said all of the things and I can identify all of the problems and the roots of it already and you just have to do A, B and C and all will be well in the world. Um, and I just need to stop and I need to slow down and know that oftentimes the client inherently has the answer and wisdom in them. And I just have to be curious enough and answer and ask the right questions to help them find those answers and path themselves. Um, so I think just curiosity, curiosity, curiosity. Mm. So awesome. Such great advice. Tisha, if people want to check out your courses, if they want to follow your work, uh, what's the best place uh, or where's the best place to send them? Yeah, so they can check out my personal um, professional website, which is just tishamorgan.com. Um, or if they're looking to take some Westland Academy of Clinical Sex Therapy courses, you can just out, check out uh, our website, Westland Academy of Clinical Sex Therapy, and it'll have them all listed there. Um, they can do them from the comfort of their home. They can start the courses at any time, move through them at their own pace. Um, and they provide really tangible tools and solutions to some of these common issues we talked about today. 
Mm, so awesome. Thank you so much for being on the Practice of the Practice podcast. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. You know, I love shows like this where, you know, as we get questions uh, on the clinical issues, we can just point to the show. And, you know, something that we haven't talked about in a long time is, you know, a lot of you are starting to ask questions about uh, if you want to start your own podcast, if you want to kind of grow beyond your private practice and go national or international. I mean, honestly, a podcast is one of the best ways to do that, if not the best way, because I mean, you can have these long conversations. Think about a YouTube video. You know, most of them are what, two to five minutes long and you know, people ha have an attention span of even less than that. Uh, so if you're interested in resources on starting your own podcast, of, of getting out there, the world needs highly trained people to be doing podcasts. There are just too many armchair experts. And I do like the show Armchair Expert. Dex Shepard does a great job with that show and brings in some other experts. I actually met him here in Traverse City at Poppy Cox Restaurant. And I had such a freak out moment. He was walking next to me and I just went, I love armchair expert, like a big dork. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, thank you. And then he walked away and I just felt like such a dweeb. But anyway, there's a lot of armchair experts that are out there and you know, they just, you know, they're self-proclaimed experts. They're not you with a master's or doctorate with all the experience. The world needs more highly trained podcasters out there. Uh, we need to take to the world what, what you have inside of you. And if you want some help with that, we have Podcast Launch School over at podcastlaunchschool.com. It's a self-paced course that'll help you launch that podcast. We also do done for you podcast launches and everything in between. So if you already have a podcast and you want some kind of backend support, uh, we have all sorts of uh, plans over there to help with the audio engineering, with the show notes and all that sort of stuff over at podcastlaunchschool.com. So uh, I just thought of that uh, as we were talking because these kind of issues need to be out in the world more and more and more. And also, we could not do the show without our sponsors. Alma is our sponsor of today's show, and they know, as do I, as do you, that building a private practice can be challenging. Growing your caseload, navigating insurance, and managing billing and paperwork can take so much time. And Alma gives you so many tools to help you build a thriving practice and get credentialed within 45 days, credentialed in 45 days. I mean, that's insane. So you can learn more about bribing, bribing, <laughs> building and thriving, about bribing a uh, private practice. You can learn more about building a thriving, not bribing, a private practice over at helloalma.com forward slash Joe. Again, that's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash Joe to get started. Thanks for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have an amazing day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music, and this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one.